So there's three types of behavior management plans we're going to talk about. The first is a whole group, then a small group, and an individual plan. And all of these are going to work together to help manage your students and help create expectations for them. Hey there, Kelly Jackson from the Simply Organized Teacher. I'm so excited because today I am here to talk to you all about behavior management. So this month on the Simply Organized Teacher, I'm focusing everything on the blog, on the podcast, and my emails all around classroom management because it's summer and we're on break, woohoo! But that also means that it's time to start planning for next year. So in today's video, I'm going to take some time to go over the three different types of behavior management plans I want you to try and set up in your classroom now during the summer so that way when the school year starts, you have them prepped and ready to go. So there's three types of behavior management plans we're going to talk about. The first is a whole group, then a small group, and an individual plan. And all of these are going to work together to help manage your students and help create expectations for them. And pretty obvious, your whole group is going to be how you're going to manage your whole class as a whole when you're out in the hallway, when they're doing things in the classroom. Small group is gonna be if they're sitting in cooperative learning tables or while they're at stations, and then individual is obviously going to be how you're gonna reward each and individual student. The thing I want you to keep in mind is try your hardest to make all of these behavior plans wrap around being positive. I know it's hard, especially when you've got a kid that is driving you crazy or you've got a class that's been there. It's so easy just to wanna to give out consequences and call out students. I get it, I've been there. But I'm gonna encourage you to think about these through the lens of being positive and rewarding them and praising them constantly. In fact, I was listening to a podcast this morning while I was out walking my dogs, and the person that she was talking to on the interview was talking about how she's done some research that shows for each negative interaction a kid has, they need 10 positive interactions. I thought it was one to three. She's saying it's one to 10. I don't know, but that's a lot of praising and positive reinforcement especially for those kids that drive you bonkers. All right, so let's talk about some whole group management plans. So there's a ton of ideas out there. All you have to do is search it on Pinterest and you'll find a ton. But here are some that I've done in my classroom and some that I know that friends have done that have worked really well. The first idea I wanna talk about is the marble jar. The marble jar is super easy because you can use this for multiple classes. You just get a different jar, tie a ribbon around it for each color of the class, and then as the kids uh, line up correctly or get a praise while you're out in the hall or they're working really cooperatively together, just throw some marbles in there. Something I did to help fill the jar up quicker, especially at the beginning of the year when you wanna reward them frequently, is I would say, okay guys, um, I'm gonna send you back to your desk. If we can go back to our desk without talking and walking, then I will give us five marbles. And then if they did that, I would give five marbles. Or maybe if you kids talked, i take a marble away and only give four. So then I'm filling up the jar quicker. The kids are seeing that improvement and that growth and they're motivated and excited. Another thing is whenever you're thinking about what kind of rewards you wanna give your whole group, let them be the ones who come up with the ideas. Sit in a class meeting, have them share ideas, vote, and then make those rewards. Write them on the jar. I would always just put a little sticky note right on the back. Write them on the jar so that way the kids can see those rewards that they're working for. Another idea I've seen before is uh, like a linking chain. You know, you just cut strips of construction paper and then put them together and link them from the ceiling to the floor. And then maybe once it gets halfway, you get a reward. Once it makes it all the way to the floor, you get a reward. So just things like that, that's really easy and a very visual way that the kids can see their growth and their progress. I also had a friend who did brownie points. So she had like a little aluminum uh, pan and little cutouts of brownies that whenever the class was making a good choice, she'd give them, she'd put a brownie up for uh, in the pan for each positive uh, reinforcement that they got. And then once the pan got filled up, they got to choose whatever reward it was that they wanted. Maybe sometimes it was brownies. I'd I'd be down for that. Something I started this year because I was not managing the marble jar well was a hundred shirt. And so I made a huge hundred shirt on a piece of po uh, poster board. And as the class was making good choices, we would write, I had two classes. We had a purple and a green group. So as the class was making a good choice or following expectations, I would write, I, I would just choose a kid, go write purple group on a number. And then at the end of the week, whenever I would um, call for rewards, if it was a if a group number was called, then that whole group got whatever reward it was that we decided on. So that was a fun one that motivated the kids. And it was exciting. Something you know you need to think about is 
the behavior plan you have in place at the beginning of the year may not still be enticing and engaging at the end of the year. So it's okay to change them throughout the year and keep Um, you know, kind of the excitement and the engagement going with the new behavior plan. So going on that, like engaging and changing them out, one I saw when I was just doing some Pinterest research before I made this video was the Mr. Potato Head. And I've forgotten all about this, but if you just go and search Mr. Potato Head positive behavior, uh, you'll see that it's just a blank Mr. Potato Head that uh, the pieces to like the lips and the eyes or whatever in a little bucket next to it. And every time the class earns a reward or earns a praise, uh, they get to put a different piece on the Mr. Potato Head. I thought that would be really fun, especially at the end of the school year, kind of like just a fun, different way to change it up. The last idea I have is uh, called Preferred Activity Time. It actually comes from this book right here called Setting Limits in the Classroom. And it's a great way to help kids uh, see the impact of their time. So how it works is on the whiteboard, you have a positive and a negative sign. So you give the kids, how I did it in my classroom was I would I would say, okay guys, I'm giving you 10 minutes of preferred activity time. So on Friday, the expectation was the last 10 minutes of the day would be preferred activity time. So whenever we would train, I, I did this when I had a really difficult class that was very chatty and didn't wanna uh, follow expectations right away. So I would say, okay guys, uh, it's time to put away your math journals. I need you to meet me on the carpet. And I would have a little timer. I wore it around my neck all day long. It was kind of annoying, but I would say, go, or you have 20 seconds, go. And I'd start the timer. And I would literally let the timer go if they say they finish in 17 seconds and they're all on the carpet sitting quietly. Then they have earned three seconds on the positive side of the preferred activity time chart. Maybe they went 24 seconds. Well, now they've lost four seconds. So I'd keep this running tally of uh, time they earned and time they lost throughout the week. And then at the end of the week, I'd add it all up and uh, they, that would tell us how much preferred activity time they got. So sometimes they would get less than 10 minutes. Sometimes they would get more than 10 minutes. It, it all depended on their choices, but they were able to visually see like how their choices were affecting their time. I would say that if you have a particularly challenging group, I would say even try doing it every day, preferred activity time. So you get five minutes at the end of the day that's free time. You know, they can bring their electronics or uh, games or, you know, whatever it is that, that you want to allow them to do, whatever it is they want to vote on to do, um, do it on an almost daily basis. Sometimes you have to do that with groups is give them rewards so frequently so that they can see they can get those rewards. All right, the next one we're gonna talk about is a small group. Some teachers do this. I have not found it to be particularly effective in my classroom, and it, it was just a lot for me to keep up with. So I didn't really do a whole lot of small group uh, behavior management plans. The one thing I did try a few times was um, table points. So I would have a chart on my whiteboard, and how many of tables I had is how many slots there were on the chart, and they would, every time like that table was the first to get cleaned up or that table made it to the carpet quickest or that team was working really cooperatively together, I would put a, a point on uh, their part of the chart and then when they made it to five or 10 or whatever it was that we had established was the goal, then they would get some kind of reward. But it was really important to me that um, they weren't ever competing against each other, they were just competing against their own team. So if table two got five points, but table three was still at one, then only table two erased their points or whatever table it was that I said got the points would erase their points and start over. But the tables that hadn't made it yet were still working towards their goal. Another thing you can think about is all those whole group ideas that I just shared. Think about how you can modify those for a small group. So each table gets a chain that hangs off Maybe it, it um, is at the ceiling above their table, and then once it reaches their table, they get the reward. So just little things like that. You could add, uh, if they have team names or team numbers, you could add those teams to the 100 chart. I never thought about that. That would have been a great idea to implement this year. Um, so just think about how can you take the whole group and modify them to the small group. The other behavior management plan that I want to talk about is the individual. And this is the one that was always the most important to me that I kept up with the most because it allowed me to keep 
uh, each child accountable for their actions. The first thing I started out with when I started teaching was a, a classroom economic system. So I had my last name was Buckteen at the time. And so kids got Buckteen bucks for pushing in their chair quietly or walking in line correctly. Or um, I never really related it to academics. It was always to behavior. So anything, anytime they made a wife's choice, they got money for that. And then at the end of the week, that money they could use to buy at the classroom store. There was a lot more that went into it. I had kids pay for rent and they could buy their desk. And it was a really great learning experience for my kids. Um, I have a whole blog post on it that I can link to in the notes about this video. I'm not going to go into it all right now, but just the classroom economic system where kids can get paid for their good choices and then use those, uh, the whatever money that you have in your classroom, they can use that money to buy different rewards that are individual. Now, I was really good about that my first year, but I won't lie, as my years progressed and I wasn't like as motivated and excited about it anymore. I was I was really bad about handing out back team bucks and I would forget or I got tired of carrying them around in my pocket. So this past year what I ended up doing, again switching, changing in the middle of the year, it's okay. I, I had to I had to learn that myself. It's okay to change it. But I uh, that hundred shirt that I was talking about in the whole group, it actually started out as my small group and then I just modified it to uh, work for whole group and I wish I would have thought to modify for small group. But anyways I uh, would call out kids. Hey, thank you, Nicholas, for following expectations. You can go put your name on the chart. Thank you, Sammy, for um, picking up the pen on the ground. You can go put your name on the chart. And they were so excited. They get to go write their name. I, I put a little permanent marker there so that way it couldn't erase that easily. And I don't know why. Second graders loved it. So that was a really good and uh, motivating thing. And then at the end of the week, I have uh, a Kagan timer, which if you don't have one, you need one. But I had a Kagan timer that it also does like student selector stuff. So I would just push the button and it would da -da 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 -da, and uh, it would land on a number and I would call that number and whoever's name was on there, they could either get um, money. I, I still use classroom money a little bit, just not, that was kind of my like way to get out of using it all the time. But they could still get classroom money and um, or they could go to the treasure box or, or something like that. They could get some kind of reward. Another thing I did when I got tired of like carrying the money around in my pocket is I did class dojo, which I know a lot of teachers use. So I use that as my management plan. I would give kids points. I could take points away as well if I needed to, uh, but I would give kids points for their behavior. And then at the end of the week, I would say, oh, okay, you earned 17 dojo points this week. So you get $17 that you can now use at the store. And I'd, um, I even had a banker who would like give them the money, which was nice because it took that off my plate. Okay, some other fun things when I was searching, these are not things I've actually done myself, but uh, some other fun things that I've seen was the mystery student, which I have tried to do that a couple times, but I haven't been consistent with it. Um, but where you just pick a random student or you have names in a jar and then you pick that student. They don't know who you picked, but you're like, oh, I'm watching the mystery student. I did this a lot walking in line. Well, I'm watching the mystery walker. If they are walking correctly, they can get a dojo point. Um, but the mystery student that, you know, at the end of the day, if that student followed the expectations and made good choices all day, then they could earn a reward at the end of the day. Punch cards were another thing I saw where you just get like a little uh, card, like business card type size. You could even cut cardstock out with the kid's name on it. And then uh, they could get punches, like hole punches in there. And, you know, once they reach so many, then they got some kind of reward. That was a fun, easy way to keep up with it if you just want to carry a hole punch around with you all day. I don't know, maybe. The other really fun idea I heard about was when I was interviewing Michelle Ferre from Pocketful Primary uh, on the podcast a couple weeks ago. She talked about how she did blurt beans. Now she told me about this because she was telling about how a kid stuck a bean in their ear and it got stuck. So you need to be mindful of like the size of the bean that you were using. But how, how it worked is essentially she gave kids so many beans each morning and then uh, as the day progressed, every time they would blurt out or raise their or talk without raising their hand, they would have to put a blurt bean, um, they give it to her, and then whatever blurt beans were left over at the end of that lesson or the end of the day, however frequently you wanted to do it, went into a jar, kind of like the marble jar. Once the jar was filled up, then they got a reward. I think this would have been a great idea. I had a year, my second year, um, I've dubbed it the year from hell, but this would have been great that year because I had a bunch of blurter outers, and that would have been a really easy way to like help them be accountable for the amount of times that they're blurting out. The last thing I want to talk about with individual behavior plans that I kind of just feel like I need to say is or talk about is clip charts. So I know that clip charts are a really po um, like popular way of managing kids and 
Um, I even have tried to do it before, uh, but I've, I've really decided that it's not something that I, I feel is the best way to reward students. I, I totally agree that kids need to have consequences and kids need to be aware of their choices and uh, be notified whenever they're not making good choices. But I think the visual of like, oh, it's when I did it, it was always the same kids on purple or blue or whatever the high color is. And it's always the same color, the same kids on red or yellow or whatever colors are down at the bottom. And so I felt like it was useless. Like it wasn't making them make better choices. It was just pointing out you suck. You never make good choices. You're always on red or you're awesome. You're the, you're a great student. You're perfect. Uh, you know, a favorite kid or whatever. I just felt like it was always uh, reinstilling those things in their, in their minds. So I'm a big advocate for not doing clip charts, but I will say I did see when I was doing some research on Pinterest, um, I'll try to find it again and link to it, but it was the same clip chart model, but instead of being colors, it was like, it started out with like, I'm making positive choices. The next thing down, if you're moving down, was like, I need to rethink my choices. Um, and then I really can't even remember what all it said. I, I clearly didn't look at it that long. But then as it went up, like, um, I'm working hard on my choices or I'm making great choices. And so um, it was just different language instead of just the colors. So I did like that as an alternative if you're like a really big advocate for the color chart. But I know that there are schools where they get the stick and they walk around and I just, I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm not a fan, but you do you, right? There's Okay, so everything we've talked about is like being super positive and I'm all about being positive, but I'm also a firm believer the kids need consequences. And so how do you decide when to give consequences and how to give consequences? That's a good question. I'm so glad that you asked. Okay, so how I've done consequences in the past is um, usually when it's a whole group situation, like, like I said, that class from my second year that was just really rough, I had to do consequences with them. So I was still doing buck team bucks at that point. So I picked uh, two or three things that the class was doing a lot that year. It was blurting out. Uh, there was a lot of inappropriate words and pictures being drawn. And like, I think their pencils, they were always like losing their pencils or something. And so those things went on a, I think I called it like fines and violations or something. I don't know. And I made a chart and all those things were on there. I, again, I only picked two or three because me, like I can be uh, like a pessimistic kind of person where I see all the negative and not the positive. So I had to keep it minimal for myself. Um, and so if they were doing one of those things, I assigned a, and I think I even like had them vote on how much money they thought it was worth. So if you don't have a pencil, how much money should you pay to get a new pencil? Or if you're shouting out how much money should you have to pay like as for that violation. So that was something I did. Uh, with as a whole group that was a consequence that I had or if they didn't turn in their homework mm, I wouldn't do that actually because I think um, homework's a whole nother issue I, I wouldn't consequent give kids consequences for not doing their homework because a lot of times that has more to do with the parents than the kids so scratch that idea another thing I did that year uh from the year from hell you know that I talked about is I would do whole group rewards like multiple times a day so it was like okay um you know, we haven't blurted out, like I would literally set a timer for five minutes and be like, we haven't blurted out in five minutes. We get to have a dance party. This is before Go Noodle was around or any of that stuff. And so I'd like pull up YouTube and find the gummy bear song. You know what I'm talking about? The gummy bear song? I'm a gummy bear. I can't believe I just did that. Anyways, um, <laughs> we would do the gummy bear song or whatever it was that I could find that was kid appropriate and we'd have a dance party. And they loved it. And it was super easy and it was super frequent. So then I would bump it up to 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Okay, now we've made it like the whole lesson. Okay, we've made it half the day, the whole day. And then of course the rewards would get a little bit bigger as the time frame got bigger as well. Something else I've done for whole group is recess academy. Now, I will start out by saying I am not a fan of taking away recess. I'm not a fan of even having kids walk laps during recess. Um, that was something that when I was in grad school, my professor really just talked a lot about and in made me passionate about as well. So I try not to take away recess time. Um, but I do believe that you have to give consequences that match the whatever it was that they did wrong or whatever choice it was that they made. So what I'll do is like if we can't line up, this was a huge issue this year and it drives me crazy. Getting in line quietly. Like I don't understand why we can't just get in a line and, and not talk. 
I don't know. I don't understand. I don't even understand what seven and eight year olds have to talk about. Anyways, that's not what this video is about. So recess academy. Um, if they were not getting in line quietly, then I would say, okay, we're doing recess academy today. In the first five or six minutes of recess, we would spend practicing walking in line. So I'd say, okay, now we're in recess academy. We are struggling with walking in line. Let's practice because clearly we don't know how. And then what do you know? They know how to walk in line without talking. Works every time. Go a few more days. They're great in line. Then we're back. Okay, recess academy again. That's the thing that you have to be really mindful of is when you dole out consequences, you have to be consistent with them. You can't just today be like, eh, whatever, we talk in line, it's fine, I'll put up with it. And then tomorrow, no, there's no talking in line. You have to be consistent with the consequences uh, or the expectations that you have and then assigning consequences every single time because that's how they're gonna learn. Um, during the beginning of the school year, like I have expectations of how we walk into the classroom. And if they walk in talking, we go back out three or four times if we need to, because I want them to learn. So Recess Academy is kind of a cool way to uh, have them practice what it is that you want them to be better at. And it's not really taking away their, I mean, it is taking away their recess. However, if it's something that is truly a struggle, they need to have a consequence for it. And that is the most effective time to do it. Um, but you also have to be mindful that you're not taking away every single day because those kids need that recess and they need that time to run and play and get their energy out so hopefully they won't talk in line anymore. Girl can dream. Okay, so now let's talk about that really challenging student. You know which one I'm talking about, the one you have that like, oh my gosh, you, they drive you up the wall. Okay, so my um, first year of teaching I had this little boy in my class and I don't even really remember what exactly happened. I just remember that um, he had a pencil or something that he wasn't supposed to have in his hand and uh, I didn't want him to have it because he was playing with it and I said give it to me and he wouldn't give it to me you have five seconds give it to me and it was just this like power struggle of me being like I'm not gonna let you win and him being like I'm not gonna let you win and I literally like got down on the ground and was like give me whatever it is that he had and it happened to be that there was a behavior um instructional whatever person like a behavior specialist in the classroom at that time watching this all go down which makes me feel like oh my gosh so stupid I can't believe I like did this in front of that person anyways it was a really good learning point because afterwards he was like hey I understand what you were trying to do you were trying to hold him accountable for what it was that you asked him to do but it was a power trip who was going to outwin the other and it was a valuable lesson for me because I, I think that's when I kind of started to learn that me and my friend Holly have talked about this before. You're not really in control of your classroom. Um, you can try really hard to be, but at the end of the day, those kids run that classroom. And sometimes you've got some kids that are not gonna allow you to have any control in your classroom. And this was one of those kids. So I just had to learn that like sometimes, um, I'm, <sighs> I don't know if you've ever done Enneagram. I'm an Enneagram one, which means like I want everything to be just and fair. And like I told you not to do that and you're doing it. So you need to like do like it needs to be fair. You need to do what I told you to do. Um, and teaching it has been a humbling experience. That it doesn't get to be like that. Sometimes I have to back up and, and say, OK, I don't get to win this battle. This is not the hill I want to die on, as my mom would say. And you just have to walk away. And that was a time when I had to realize that, like, I wasn't going to get to always be the winner or always have the final say. So I say all that because you're going to have those kids that are, are going to be in a power struggle with you all the time. And um, you've got to come up with some ways to motivate them and to keep them engaged and to hopefully get them on your side because... At the end of the day, if a kid is on your side, they're going to be a lot more likely to follow the expectations. So it's all about building that relationship and creating that foundation. So one thing you can do is it's called 2 by 10 or 10 by 2 either way. But it's 10 days, 2 minutes a day. And for 10 days in a row, you find 2 minutes to talk to that kid uh, non-academic. And they do the talking. You don't get to talk. They have to talk. And that's really hard for me. Really, really hard. Uh, but they talk for 2 minutes. So you can ask probing questions, but then... The idea is to get them to talk about things that they care about. And first of all, you get to learn more about them. So it kind of helps softens your heart. But then they see, oh, hey, my teacher does care. My teacher's investing time in me. So that's one thing that you can try and do with those really difficult kids is build a relationship with them. 
But when you've got some uh, what I call valuable players in the classroom, you've got to have even an extra individual system for them because the positive isn't always going to work for them. They they do need some consequences and some negative uh, for their, their choices that they're making. So what I've always done is an individual plan that they walk around with to each class. And so I'll sit down with them and I'll say, hey, we're struggling in class. Um, what are some things that you think you're struggling with? They'll share. And then I'll say, okay, but these are things I'm noticing. And we'll decide on two to three of those things that we want to be uh, their focuses for improving on. So I would pick like the two or three things that annoy you the most. Blurting out, being disrespectful, although being disrespectful is a little broad. But you know what I'm saying, like pick the two or three that you feel they need the most work on. And then I just make a chart. And uh, on the chart I just like do a little table in Word and it's broken down by, you could do it by subject or time of day, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But I, I break it down so it's like super, I always did it by subject, so like language arts time, math time, specials time. And then there was a column next to it where they could get a different smiley face. Or you could do it where they have to get so many stickers. It doesn't really matter how you do it. There's a ton of ideas out there on Teachers Pay Teachers or on Pinterest. Um, but this is just what I did and what worked for me. So a smiley face got them two points, a uh, like a straight face, you know what I'm talking about, like a uh, got them one point, and then a frowny face got them no point. So they had their goals. So like a student I did this year was um, staying like in their area because they were always rolling and moving around. So staying in the area, focusing and completing my work. So those were the three things that this student was working on. So as they were working during that time, I would be paying attention to them and seeing, okay, are they are they meeting these three expectations? And then at the end of the time frame, I would give them either a smiley, a straight, or a frowny face. And then at the end of the day, they would add up their points. So, you know, maybe they got three smiley faces, two straight faces, and one frowny face. They would add that up at the end of the day. And then I, I would always have a goal. So like today our goal is to make 10 points or, you know, I always start out really small. The first day was like, let's get six points. Yay. If they met their goal, then we had three rewards. When I was having that conference with them about these are some things we're struggling with, what are some things you'd like to work for? So is it helping the coaches? Is it free draw, extra technology time, lunch with the teacher? What is it that's going to motivate that kid? And then if they met that goal, then the next day they would get whatever reward it was that they wanted to choose. I usually had two or three rewards listed on there and they could choose each afternoon which one they wanted the next day. And that was really motivating for them because they can physically see oh, I did great. Like, you know, seeing those smiley faces cheers them up. When I initially did it, I just laminated it, but then I moved on to a folder because it was just easier to keep up with. And then I could look back, we could go back and look at like their growth and their progress they had made. And, and so that was really good. And it's great documentation for RTI, for parents. So the folder, I just printed out like 20 back to back, uh, put it in a folder. And then I even had some kids that were so severe that they would have to take it home, have mom and dad sign it, and then bring it back to me the next day. And that was a good accountability for them. One thing that has always worked really well for my difficult kids is let them be the special helper. I don't know what it is about helping, but they love it. So uh, running a paper to another teacher or helping you pass out papers or like even dusting. Like I have some kids that love to dust. And sometimes even just doing something like that makes them feel like, ooh, the teacher likes me. She's trusting me with this. So something as simple as that can be motivating to a kid, letting them be your special helper. I would also advise find a teacher friend that is right down the hall from you that you can send that challenging kid to whenever uh, you can't stand them anymore. <laughs> you need a break. I That was me one year. Uh, again, back to the year from hell. There was a student that I just, I could not handle this student all day. And so I think we eventually worked it into this student schedule that they would move to another teacher halfway through the day to help alleviate and um, give me a break. But having a teacher when the kid is not following expectations. So I always say give a student two choices when they're not following expectations. Okay, you can work here and do this, or you can go to Miss So-and-So's classroom, and that's where that uh, special support teacher comes in. And I always did like a classroom teacher, not like a behavior specialist, because that I needed to be more of like a consequence. This was like an, another option. The last thing I want to say in this video, because the majority of the people following me are first year teachers or new to profession teachers. So what I want to say to you is something that took me a long time to really grasp and learn is just to advocate for yourself. Advocate for yourself and advocate for those kids because sometimes nobody else will. And you're a human too. 
you um, deserve to be treated with respect and dignity and not be kicked or spit at or any of those things. And if those kinds of things are happening happening to you, I urge you to go to a behavior specialist. If you don't have a behavior specialist, go to an administrator and just keep going higher and higher until you get somebody who's going to say, this isn't okay, let's develop a plan. Um, I waited too long to do that my second year and I just kept taking um, I just kept taking the hit and it wasn't fair to me. It was not fair to the rest of my kids in my class and it wasn't fair to that student because I, I wasn't creating the best environment for that student. So actually it was a group of four students so I wasn't creating the best environment for those kids and I needed help and sometimes you just have to be your own advocate and advocate for yourself. And so I would encourage you that if you are dealing with a student, just keep asking. Be that squeaky wheel. Keep asking. Um, and hopefully you will get somebody that will recognize what it is you're trying to do and will and will support you and help you and come up with some plans of how to handle um, that student or that group of kids or whatever it is that you're dealing with. All right, guys, that's all I have for you. Um, I've got a ton of resources up on the blog. I've got even a couple podcasts where I've talked with guests about behavior management plans. So I will link all of it. Uh, I will link to all of it in the show notes. So just make sure to check that out. And I will talk with you all next time. Bye, guys.